We have precious few moments that we share with each other. I know that there are a lot of old fans out in the audience here tonight. And it's strange to think that we have known each other for so many years, but yet it'll probably have added up to maybe one day if you added up all the hours, you know, that we've spent together. So these are precious times we spent here. Don't you agree? It's true, it's true. Believe it. And, and, and it's beautiful because I know there's some people here too that never seen the Slackers before. And that is also a beautiful thing because this is, you know, it's like a beautiful beginning, you know? It's a beginning of a, of a road we can walk together, you know? And for that, I, you know, you can't beat that, you know what I mean? Now me and Glenn have been thinking very hard about what the hell we're going to play next for you, beautiful people. But maybe you can help us out by telling us you want to hear. Yeah? yeah. What? Glenn, lean your head in there and decipher. I hear something. Okay, I got one. It seems that a lot of people want to hear a tale of deception and murder. A tale of, of romance and passion gone bad. Unbridled, Glenn Pine says. Well, here it goes. So she called me up on the slide. She said, please don't tell all your friends. Because they might tell my husband And then you know I'll never see you You know I probably wanna beat you And I'm sure we would beat me too So I called you on the slide Please don't ask cause you know why Well I won't lie and say I like the way it's all I said I'd meet you at the station Still I couldn't help but think As I drank my beer to meet her I said what the hell am I doing? And what the hell am I gonna say? My married girl don't you wanna Smoke a little marijuana Sing some time and have a drink You'll be left wanting more in the time after your man has murdered me. Now, baby, when I first saw you, I knew that I was a goner. And all those things I meant to say, well, I just forgot in our first kiss. With your husband in that river, Lord, it made me kind of. We sent flowers to his mother. So we could see each other It lasted far about three weeks And now we don't even speak So I'm sitting here alone And I'm sitting on the phone Married girl, don't you want it? Smoke a little marijuana Take some time and have a drink And think about what you gonna do You'll be left wanting more In the time after Your man has murdered me
Give us another one, please. I mean, I guess we started a punk band in high school called Sick and Mad, right? Me and my friend Happy. And we started it basically to, to pick this chick up that, that we knew. And we knew she was a punk. And uh, she was a punk, but she was one of these punks. I'm sure you had them in your high school. Like, the, the beautiful punk girl that, like, also played classical violin. You know what I mean? Like, complete genius, complete fuck up at the same time. Like, you know? The first girl I had ever heard of that was, like, you know, popping pills or, like, something. It was like, ah, oh, who is this girl, you know? So we, we decided we would start a band. Violin was close enough to bass. We would ask her to play bass. Vic had that band with Happy in high school or something in the late 80s. It was this guy, Happy, yeah. who, um, How are you he's sort of like the, the, the blue. Marcus, our bass player, played in Sick and Man. He was playing bass in college at this party. And, and, and Happy was like, dude, you gotta come play bass in my band. We need a bass player now. And it was like, hey, you know what? I got nothing else to do. It's always good to stay in a band, keep your chops up. So I went along, and uh, a couple days later, I met Vic for the first time. And you know, he picked me up in his beat up old, like, mid 70s Galaxy 500. And uh, he was blaring out some old stones. And I was like, all right, this guy's okay. Little did I know. And so, sure, that's how I met Marcus. Oh, no, no, the chick would yeah. never panned out. Never? No. What happened with that? She started going out with some uh, hippie friend of mine. Vic was in a band with Luis, our original drummer, and uh, I think they were called the Rabies, and they were breaking up. And Vic was thinking, okay, I want to form another band. Um, let me see what I can get, you know? And uh, he was like, I need a bass player. So he was like, all right, you're halfway reason. I realized he was like an extremely competent musician compared to the people we were hanging around with, you know? I mean, he could really play his bass and all. I said, hey, dude, you want to be in a, you want to be in a band with me? You know, I need to play gigs. I need to go out and play with people. And he was like, yeah, sure. And uh, right around then, I, had, I just found out about ska, you know, like specials. And I was like, do you want to be in a, a ska band? You know, I'm like, nobody's doing it. And my response was, yes, what's ska? You know, I was perfectly willing to play it, just had no idea what the hell it was. He was like, yeah, ska. He's like, play me some of it, you know? And he realized that he knew it, because he's, uh, he's Australian, right? And they have all English music over there. So he knew Madness. He had Madness records. He had no idea that there was actually a, a whole scene attached to Madness. So he gave me a tape. One half was the Specials first album, the other half was a compilation of Scatolites material. So I listened to that and learned it. So I said, okay, I got drummer, who's good. I had a real connection with him. I was playing bass at the time with Lewis. But I said, okay, I'll switch because I got a bass player. So I got drums, I got a bass player, I'll play guitar. And begin the slackers. All right, you guys ready? Roll, action. Well, see, it all happened real natural, right? Like, that's one of the cool things about the way the chemistry happened. Marcus knew TJ from college, from that same band that he played when Happy met him. I met Q-Max, me and him were working together in a gourmet shop, and he was wearing a fishbowl hat, you know? So we went out, we were drinking 40 ounces and talking about music. And he's like, yeah, I play, yeah, I play this, I play that, I sing a little bit, and hey, come by. And so needless to say, bam, there it was. That was the original five. And we stayed five members for about, like, maybe two years. 
for two years. They were, <laughs> well, they weren't so good, you know? Yeah, they were kind of garagey, um, very much on the garage thing, and they were all, even though the, the music was very three-chord rock and stuff, uh, and Scott, they were definitely music heads. Vic is definitely a student of music, not like people in the other band aren't, but um, he, you can really hear the influences to so many of, like, so much stuff outside the ska scene or outside the reggae scene. Yeah. I think people and, and musicians locally um, respected what they were trying to do and what they were after, but they weren't quite there, you know. It, it, I think a lot of us could see that they had a little ways to go. That whole uh, era is like we call it the nods now, that, that band, because it really almost changed, you know, like it was almost like a different band. Well, I was in love with this woman, and uh, she was from the East Coast. I had met her when I was on tour with Donkey Show in New York in 89, I guess it was, and that's when I, I met her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was pretty obsessed with her. And she said, oh, I don't want to live in California anymore. I want to go back to New York. And I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, and it was weird because basically a year and a half after I, we, I came to New York, we were broken up. I didn't have the intention of doing music at all. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really practicing. I was, I was doing sociology. I was focused on that. Well, I find it odd that I didn't want to play saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, well, you know, saxophone saved my life, man. I was I was a real wreck and drinking too much and really negative. And I would just go in the basement of my old place in Brooklyn and turn off the lights and just practice. And that got me focused on doing something. Mm -hmm. It's got, you know, I started not just seeing myself as a fan of the music, but somebody who wanted to make the music, you know. I'm happy. He met Dave's girlfriend at SVA, started talking about the band and the slackers and stuff like that, and she's like, Psh, my boyfriend plays ska music and he plays a saxophone. He's like, oh, well, tell him to come to the show and bring a saxophone or something. And I just moved here, and that was the first week I was here, and I came to see the slackers, and I had already known them and stuff, and he had never met them. He just sort of showed up with this with a sax. And I'd heard the Hepcat CD, the first CD out of nowhere had just come out, and uh, 
I got to the show and all of a sudden the sax player from Hepcat gets on stage and starts blowing the slackers and I'm like and they'd already asked me to join the band and I was kind of like being kind of hesitant about it thinking like they don't have a horn section you know they're not really playing horn based music and all of a sudden I'm like if the sax player from Hepcat's going to play with the slackers I definitely want to play with the slackers what happened was we were very happy playing the type of music that we were playing Right, which was like I said, this two tone. We wanted to be the specials, pretty much. And uh, I wanted to be Paul Weller. Like I really wanted to be English. You know what I mean? And then when Dave and Mush came in the band, they introduced us to all these other records, and they just made us tapes. You know, and we were like, hey, let's play this. You know, hey, let's try that. And they were like kind of criticizing us and kind of trying to push us into the direction that they thought we would sound good. And then, I, you know, the interests in the band started to change. Jeremy was the one who came in with this really heavy reggae background. He wanted us to be like a Naya Bingy dub roots rock kind of thing, which was cool as hell as far as I was concerned. You know, the more dub, the better. And that was, that was a lot of fun. And Dave came in and wanted to be more of a jazz player and more of a, of a, of a jazz, in an improvisational jazz approach. He, he wanted to bring like a real freedom to the, to the, the band and, and really did because he's a hell of a player, you know. So given a, a, a venue where he could just play whatever he wanted, he really like expanded people's horizons and, and made us look at the whole band differently. And like one day, after like a couple of months of thinking about it, sitting home and like just pining over you know pondering like you know hurting my brain I came in and I was like yo I'm like we shouldn't play like half the songs we play anymore I'm like that's it I'm like all these songs the punk songs the two-tone songs all this shit out I'm like we sound better playing like old ska I'm like and, and reggae I'm like we sound much better I we had taped all these rehearsals and shit I was like that's it what do you think? You know, and, and everybody kind of agreed. There was about a eight month or a year period which I hadn't heard them. And during that time, Dave Hilliard had joined the band. And the next time I heard them, they were entirely different. And there's this tune they have, uh, Runaway. And they just worked it into it. They have this, you know, this one bar, one empty bar right in the middle of it. and. You know, it's you can't think that it really the song's over the way it is, you know, the way it hangs like that. You kinda know it's not, but the silence that night, it was the first time any of us were hearing this arrangement of Runaway. Pretty much the way it comes out on, on the record. And those four bars of silence, man, you just heard people like to say if you could record the record they would press it you know if they liked your band and with us some friends of ours that were working there particularly Vic Rice and uh, and my, my old girlfriend Chrissy had convinced uh, Buck to give us money we, you know we got enough money to get in the studio and Victor Rice to sort of to make sure we didn't do anything too stupid <laughs> and uh, you know, so we started recording a record. We just agreed that uh, when you try and make a recording that sounds to, up to date, you therefore will have a recording that's dated 10 years later. But if you try and make something that sounds kind of old and different and not necessarily old, but not modern and not as correct as you can make with the equipment of the day, then uh, you wind up with something timeless. Check it. Well, you can. Vic 
Bryce, he knew that he knew that he could be honest with us when we were sucking, and he knew that he could get the sounds out of us if he knew, you know, that they were in there. Because he was already a fan of the band. You know, he was like one of our few cheerleaders, like at the gigs. He'd be like, dude, you guys are gonna do it, man. You guys are doing great, you know? And we really respected him because he's a fucking, he's a monster, you know? He really, like, you know, helped us make that record sound really together and great, you know? Yeah, it was the first, the first punch, man, you know, in the, in the game. Somebody get your Lord. The band was getting a lot better. We had done tours. You know, we had just started really like taking shit extra serious. And um my old my old girlfriend was really critical of things. Like she was another one of those great people, man. Like she would just like she was like our manager, you know? And she would like ride the shit out of us and tell us what to do better, what to do worse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> you know, what to do worse, like, you know, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, we, me and Vic, at the same time we were doing the Slackers, we were doing Stubborn All-Stars. And Stubborn All-Stars got offered some dates opening for Rancid in Europe. So, um, we went on this European tour, and that where, that's where Tim got to hear, you know, a bunch of the horns, and Vic, and so he decided that hey, he wants us to come with him on uh, the upcoming La Palooza tour. Django actually, uh, Jeff Baker from Stubborn was already playing trombone with Rancid a little bit, and uh, Rancid wanted a keyboard player, so Django uh, said to get Vic, and then. Um, Vic ended up bringing Dave also, so they had uh, the three of them playing horns and Vic playing keyboard. And then Vic was seeing uh, this girl, Chrissy, that they call the Wicks at the time, so he invited her in the bus. And her thing is that she's little, so she likes going on tour and she won't take up a lot of space, so you know, she can sit like in the corner and she's like, you know, I won't eat much and I won't take up a lot of space and stuff. And Tim took a, from uh, Rancid took a liking to her and said, hey, I'm uh, starting this new record label. You want to come to LA and be the president of it? And she's like, okay. So she did. starting this label, there's a shitload of hype about it. And we were one of the first bands on the roster. Like one of the first bands of like however many, seven bands. So everybody listened to our record. You know? Red light got red light got listened to by all these really like cool people. And it it made an audience that was so much bigger than than the little ska audience that we had, had off a of moon. Give them the boot sampler. At first give them the boot. I was riding in a van with this band Ruder Than You that I was playing with at the time. And Watch This came on. And I was like, who, who the fuck is this? You know, this sounds amazing. Like they had, it was really, it sounded really classy and classic. And 
and uh, and familiar, you know, like a song that you you'd heard before in a really good way. And when I asked who it was, and the guy up front told me it was the Slackers, I was like, "Are you kidding me?" You know, like I was, I felt so proud. I felt really proud that they'd gotten there, you know, to that point um, where they got their sound together and they really got across what they've been trying to get across for so many years. And I also felt really hurt that like they'd managed to stay together and get there. And the band that I was in, you know, Age 99, who'd been playing all these shows with them and who had a competition with them, wasn't able to do that. You know, we, we broke up and I was, it, it hurt me for the longest time. But uh, it was also good to know that somebody had made it. You know? yeah. But I can't complain It also really looked New York and sounded New York. It was one of those things we were really trying to get across. It was like, we're not Jamaican. We're like New Yorkers playing Jamaican music. You know, we also like rock and roll. We also like garage music and, uh, and boogaloo and Latin music. And all that shit was really starting to get mixed in. You know, the band was really starting to gurgle and shit, you know? That's why Red Light really becomes like a step of us trying to refine ourselves. In a lot of ways, a lot of people thought that Red Light was our first record, because it was the first record that we made on Hellcat. And in a lot of ways, Red Light was our first record you know, of like the next, you know? It was like the first record of the real, of the real band. Yeah, definitely. But like, I'll, I'll just like start the whole thing. Whatever. I started playing actually playing in marching bands for money, like I played in the Italian Roma band in Boston. And I met a lot of fellow musicians that were doing that in the summertime. Jeremy, he played in the Roma band, the Italian band with me. Okay. So he moved to New York and uh, he's like, hey man, I got this, you know, he's there down, you know, playing with the Slackers for a number of years. And he's like, hey man, you should come down and, you know, we got a, we got a tour coming up because they had just released Red Light. And they're like, you gotta, you gotta come down, man. You know, we got this tour coming. I think this would be really good. I'm like, yeah, she's great. You know, send me some music. So he sort of came on as a hired gun for the, the tour for Red Light. He wasn't on Red Light, but he came for the Red Light tour. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely, you could see he was a character right off the bat. He sort of fit right in. You know, I think he sat, you know, there's a spot in the van where Glenn sits. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure on the first day he was in the van, he sat in that spot. And he hasn't really moved since. It was definitely weird. It was definitely like, okay, this is like trial by fire. You know, this is going to be interesting. I'm like with seven or eight people, you know. I know one of them very well, but the other guys I didn't know at all. So it was just, it was, it was interesting. I think they were kind of feeling me out, kind of like, okay, who's this, what's this guy about? Cool, he plays, plays trumpet, he plays really, you know, pretty well, and this is cool. And, uh, and I can remember somewhere, I think it was Lawrence, Kansas, that we were hanging out after the show, and... We were all hanging out having a few drinks or something. We're like, I think they sort of acknowledged, like, one of us. You're one of us, you know? I was like, okay, cool. I 
I think the Slackers had done some stuff down the East Coast. I think they had played Florida before my time. And it, I think they went a little bit out in the Midwest, but really not much. So when I joined the band is when they were really starting to be really active touring around. So it was really new for everyone, really. I don't think anybody had really any idea what it would be really like, like for a month out or so. It was really sort of rough, every night, one night or so, every night across the country. So those are the first couple of tours, and then we just continued doing a lot of tours by ourselves. Just every night trying to win new people. Like we were like, uh, you know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. You know, they go around knocking on everybody's doors, telling them, "Hey, you know, this exists. You can be saved." And that's what we were like with Scott. You know, we walked around like, like proselytizing. You know, don't you know that it's out there? It exists. You know, <laughs> it's real. And it's like, you know, we wanted everybody to believe it, man, to, to really fucking go for it. Think about what a priest does. A priest says, I'm not gonna make money. I'm not gonna go out with ladies. I'm just gonna fucking do this. I mean, it's very similar. I couldn't keep, I couldn't keep a girlfriend for, for many years. Because music basically ruins relationships pretty, pretty consistently. Um, yeah, I couldn't keep any money. I couldn't live anywhere because I wasn't getting paid enough to keep an apartment and go on the road. So I just lived on the road. So it became like kind of like, yeah, it was kind of like being a monk. Like I gave my, I gave my life over to, to music. And not, not only that, I mean, to tell you how sick it was. I mean, when, when Hellcat started, it was my, my girlfriend that was the, that was gonna work for Hellcat. I mean, she ended up doing it. And I mean, we decided that she was going to go to California, you know, to, to do this. And I mean, we basically decided that, like, this was going to be the big sacrifice of, like, our relationship for music. And we really felt that this was a mission that couldn't be ignored. We, we, were, being, we were being given an opportunity to do something that was really important. And, like, uh, basically it was, like, to hell with everything else we're gonna treat it like you got drafted mm -hmm. you know who can you can't not do this and then she was like yeah she's like I think you're right I mean I, you know it was not my decision it was our decision yeah and it really did kill our relationship we had this a beautiful thing and I don't know what the hell happened it just completely destroyed it Yeah. <laughs> 
hard to write when I was a teenager. I had a girlfriend, all she wanted me to do was write her love song. All I could write about was the government and, and society and principles and cops. And she was like, why can't you write me a fucking love song, Vic? You know? And like, I, I even wrote her a song about why I couldn't write her a love song. You know, that was called Love Song. Lo love song, love song. How can it be wrong? You know, it's like it's all been said before, you know, some shit like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't explain using the same words that are always in the love songs. You know, I tried to be sweet about it, but I, I couldn't, you know. And then when she broke up with me, that was when the outpouring started, man, you know. And that was the beginning of the slackers. Because before then, she had inhibited my, my musical interests because they were competing with her. I mean, I guess we broke up, but I mean, the way I saw it was that I was just fucking completely dissed, you know? And uh, that was it. I wrote love songs for like five years after that, like nonstop. I, I first wrote all sad songs about, oh, she was all I ever wanted and all this trouble and, you know, and Sarah, you know? Like that was the songs, that was her. And uh, then after that, I realized that it existed, that love existed, and that it was a force. And so then I started writing songs about, oh, yeah, I saw this pretty girl, you know, like you don't know why, you know, standing in the elevator, looking at some girl, and just not having the balls to talk to her at all, and just staring her up and, you know, the ride 20 flights up in an elevator, and just being like, you know, 
your mind is spinning because you want to talk to her. So that's, you know, all of a sudden, it was almost like that was, it was the affirmation that love existed, that I didn't have it anymore. And I was sad, you know? <laughs> have yet to write a real happy love song because it's difficult there's not that many really it's hard to do man only Stevie Wonder and Van Morrison can really write happy songs on a consistent you know they write such happy songs Stevie Wonder isn't she lovely you know and that's about his baby I think isn't she lovely I don't know. Van Morrison writes about like I mean there's some line about you know you know, walking down the boardwalk, seeing all the girls dressed up for each other. You know, it's just like, he's like walking, swinging, like, yeah, this is great, man, you know? And it's so hard to do. You 
What you do in kind. What you do in kind. What you do in kind. That's what I thought of. So it's. Could I raise the spirits of a broken heart? If chance, if chance presents itself, would you do in kind? when you really do it, right? It's not so far out, the hook, right? Come on, it's not that far away, is it? Oh, shit. Well, even if it is, it's, it's worth the trip. We love playing here. We're going to make it a habit there, you know what I mean? I know. And I, Glenn Pine is so excited right now, he's going to do a special tune just for you. Oh, wait, I have to do something here. I too am going to do something special for this too. Oh, watch out, people. Watch out. That's right. Get ready. Was it show and tell right now?
Dancing is is the main is the main thrust of this band, you know, and especially getting guys and girls to dance with each other, like to make sex happen as easily as possible with the help of our music. Like it's supposed to be like soul music. It's at a Philadelphia Unitarian Church in the basement. We played a gig, and according to some of the people in the audience. Some folks were getting a little more than happy as we were playing, and there was a couple that went way in the back and consummated their happiness. Now that is the zenith, the epitome of music right there. You not only got them moving, you got them naked and moving. That's why it's so important to make people dance. Music is communication. If you don't communicate, you're failing. And the ultimate uh, proof that you've reached somebody is making them move. You don't need to speak their language. You, you, if you can make somebody else dance, then you have really hit the pinnacle of your musical abilities. We were in El Paso, Texas, and I hadn't drank for about three years, which I don't talk about this a lot, but the only reason it's like relevant is because I used to dance to a lot of different music, a lot of ska and reggae music, and love and drinking beers and dance and dancing. But I got sober, man, I got really like, uh, aware, super aware of people, and I would feel like weird dancing, and, and so the Slackers were playing in El Paso, man, I was able to like, for the first time in that, it's probably been three or four years I've been sober, dance through an entire set and get out of myself and not think about people looking at me and be weird. I thanked them that night, I go, man, this is the first night I was able to like, to like really like, be lost in, in your music, and it was so beautiful, man, and, and like dance the whole time and just have a... It was it was it was a, it was a breakthrough thing. Get out, man. There is no way. I mean, I was at the I was at the Warp Tour a couple of years ago. I was completely disgusted. I was like, these all these big jock guys that are slamming around and like knocking all these girls over. And I'm like, you, my friend, need to get laid. And the problem is, you are not going to get laid 
by knocking all the girls over. I mean, it's not goddamn caveman times anymore, you know? You get arrested for that shit, you know? It's like, the times have changed. You need to dance with the girl. You need to, you know, make something happen, you know? And I mean, the, if there's anything I can do to help that along, that's, that's the purpose, you know? Dancing, I mean, I'm not a great dancer. I'm not, I'm a horrible dancer. But I mean, musicians, we're all horrible dancers, but we dance with our fingers, you know? something the other day. Louis Armstrong said there's two kinds of music. It's good and bad. You know? And that's kind of like, I think, I believe in that. I feel, feel like if I listen to something and it's performed with soul, then it's good. If it's not performed with soul, it's just performed to, to, uh, to fill, fill a niche. I don't feel it. And I don't, I don't, I feel that the slackers perform with soul. And that's, I think, what their intention is. I don't think they, they can play any other way. Every time 
I'm checking their, you know, their listings on shows and everything. They're touring Europe, touring everywhere. Hardest working ska band. They got the heart for it. They yeah. love the music. And, dude, you know. See, I'd, I'd love to get this band to that level where you're just yeah. constant touring and get a fat ass following like that. They're just huge. That's the side. That's, we want to get to that level. Yeah. If people want to hear us play music, we're going to do it. You know, if, like I said, if we're lucky enough to do that. That, that that absolutely we'll play the music two one-hour sets or uh, at least an hour and 15 minutes followed by a 15-20 minute encore. So, yeah, we range between an hour and a half and two and a half, three hours. Alright, baby. I just want to thank you people for being such a lovely audience tonight. Sharing a beautiful evening with us and all. Old turf over here. Ladies and gentlemen, Clint Pond! Something, it's fun, of course, you know, liquid courage. You know, you people have a few drinks, next thing they get loose, you know, a little lubricated, then they're like, all of a sudden, next thing, you know, everybody's dancing, having a good time. And then we pick up on it, we feed on that. They're cool. Like, everybody's starting to really open up and not be so like, rigid. And they, the second set, they're like, oh yeah, you know? So that's when we have fun, is when people get loose and you know, have fun.
Peace. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I personally love playing two sets. That's my, my, my favorite. Just being able to settle into a place, try different things, mm -hmm. play for a long time. It's, it's not just about getting up in front of audience, it's actually, you know, getting to do your thing, you know? You bust your ass all day long to get to play a gig, and you stop after 45 minutes? What are you, <laughs> nuts? That one just blew me away. I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. You people drive 10 hours, spend six hours setting up your equipment, yabba, 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 and you only want to play for half an hour? What are you, crazy? You go through all this bullshit and then you stop? <laughs> you know, it's like, you could keep playing. <laughs> Did nobody realize that? I mean, I understand some bands, you know, like, like I've, I've seen the Ramones and Lars, like, God, I don't know how these guys can do it. They've got to be like 50 and they're, you know, playing like wild men, 45 minutes of that. If you're running around like a maniac, maybe you should be... No, I have no, you have no excuse. Most of the bands are running around like maniacs. They're in good shape, they're young, they have no real excuse why they can't do that for two hours. Yeah. You spend all this time and effort getting here, and you're like, okay, we're done. Hey, pst, pst, time, time, we're done here. What are you, Teamsters? Give me a break. <laughs> so I like Teamsters, by the way. Yeah. I'd like to be a Teamster. Does anyone out there? I was a member of the AFL-CIO for many years. <laughs> Love to be a Teamster. Unions are good. <laughs> It's different. It's Afro-Caribbean. It's uh, it, 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 it's got a lot of swing. It, it's it's got a lot of open space in it. It lilts and it sways. It's not like a heavy wall of sound, thud, thud, thud. You know, with, with nothing between the cracks. It's all between the cracks kind of shit. That's that's what I dig about it. You know, there's a lot of room to uh, to play because there's a lot of silence in between the notes. Every note's got a little silence between it, so it's elastic, it's like a sponge. Yeah. It's not like modern music is... That's why modern music sounds to me. You know what I mean? Their music is more like... like that, you know? Like you can... you can swim in it. You know? Yeah, that's not that's cool. They started, they came up, the Scottalites developed a music called ska. And if you listen to it, sometimes it reminds you of some of the shuffle, shuffles from New Orleans. Some of the accents on the two and the four, you know? Some of this, the skank is always suggested. And if you listen to some of that stuff, I've heard that if you listen to some of that stuff, you can kind of hear it. it almost sounds like the walking bass lines or the syncopated bass lines. It sounds like either, like I said, Latin music or even sounds like I said, like, you know, New Orleans boogie woogie and stuff. You hear that and you're like, okay, that makes sense. I think it's a very accidental. Like they were copying boogie woogie shuffles and blues and R&B from, from the 50s, you know, and even earlier. And they come up with ska, you know, because they shuffle the beat around. Instead of it just being a regular blues shuffle, you know, da doom da bop ba doom da bop ba doom da bop. All of a sudden it's, you know, da 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 ba but, you know, they picked up on one little part of it and they switched the bass drum, which is something that Americans never would have done. There's a lot of space. You know, the bass, if the bass is syncopated, there's, there's a lot of space so that the ska, the skank, can fill it. Like, it, everybody has a, a role in the rhythm section, in the music. That interplay, that back and forth like the you know the motion of the dance is that like I said the skank or the drums the way the drum drops where it hits is a hit with the bass or where does the, where does the bass fall within it but like I said it's back and forth it's like a pendulum or something you know um, so we, we, we wanted to try to really bring that out the skank like that or whatever, and make sure that that was out front. Because you hear it, you're like, oh man, this is per perfection. Not a band.
you know, if, listen if you, to the old yeah, stuff. Yeah, even if you listen to this, uh, um, different compilations all over the world, a lot of bands are trying to sound like the Slackers, a lot of bands are trying to sound like Hepcat, you know, it's like, and, and Hepcat and the Slackers, those bands are, are listening, they're influenced by the old school stuff, you know, it's, 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 it's old school, even all the way back to Ska before Ska, when Jamaicans were influenced by American R&B, it's like, yeah. it, it's, it's, a, it's really a big circle, you know what I mean? It's like, even if you listen to Slacker, some of their stuff, their stuff's not even, it, it's so past, like, being influenced by Scott that they go back to American music, you know, R&B, blues, you know, jazz, the boogie-woogie vibe, it's like, you know, you t it's a full circle, man. Whatever we do, we always are conscious of the tradition. And like I said, we want to be very respectful of the music and try to play it correctly and then put our own little spin on it. You know, to Because we're not living in Jamaica in the late 50s, early 60s, where guys growing up in the East Coast, you know, that listen to pop music. tried to get across and the things we always respected in in music is honesty like I think we've always tried to be a really honest band think about like the British invasion and about how they really wanted to be blues players you know you listen to the Stones and the Yardbirds and the Who everybody wanted to play American blues but they screwed up and they didn't play it right but what they invented was British rock you know which is like wow that's that's an amazingly, you know, it's an amazing fuck up, you know, mm -hmm. and and they did it because they were being honest about it. They were like, yes, I mean, I want to be Howlin' Wolf, but I'm I'm Mick Jagger, you know. So yeah, I I want to be a Southern woman, but I'm Mick Jagger. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like so you try as hard as you can, and and you come out with something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to be an old, I would love to be Howlin' Wolf myself. You know, I would love to be an old black guy. I would love to be whatever. But I'm who I am, you know? It's like, uh, D Dave, Dave told me, stop trying to be an English guy when he joined the band, you know? Sing with your own accent. He's like, guess what, Vic? You've got an accent, <laughs> you know? You sound like you're from somewhere. Like, use it, you know? Don't, don't pretend to be Terry Hall, you know? Which is, which is what I was doing, you know? B between him and, and, and Paul Weller and stuff. You know, I was like, yeah, but those English guys sound so cool. You know, he's like, yeah, but, you know, he's like, I'm he, Dave's from California. To me, to, to him, I'm f some fucking weird exotic thing. I'm this like weird, like scruffy Italian creature that he's like, wow, it's so weird. I've, you know, I've never seen like, you know, I mean, maybe it's not that, he's not that naive, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. he sees me as being something unusual, you know. So it's like being honest with yourself, being being willing to go there, and 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 that's where like real, that's where the real shit comes from.
my youth The days when I was strong And this world was so new But I could have one more time If I could have one more time Just one Oh please give me one more time Give me one more time When you sit next to somebody on the train, listen to what they're saying. Because you never know what they're going to say. People say the most fucked up shit, you know? And it's like, that's where you're going to get it from. That's where you're going to get the lines from, you know? And, and this is the night. I say something like, love is my cancer, you know? Like, that's something like, I, I can't remember if it was that line. You'd something, somebody's yelling at somebody on the phone saying, you know, you are my cancer, you know? Like, ah, you know? And I'm just like, what a fucking line. I'm like, that is beautiful. You know? And they just throw it out. They just give it out to the fucking universe. And they don't remember they even said it. And me, I'm standing behind them with a notebook. Love is my cancer. I like that. You know? Like, these are all, those are all things that really come straight out of people's mouths. I, I get, I get turned on by, like, you know, by that kind of interaction you know that's where you see fucking real beauty in life it's not contrived it's really fucking it's happening you know people pissed off at each other in the middle of the street you know that's where real fucking that's where life is really going on and if you can capture that that's art you know i mean not even that's art is life you know people are life and 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 they're they're creating art every every minute that they're walking around doing shit. But like, if you can capture that, then you've, you've actually like, you've tapped into the vein, you know? All right, I'd like to tell you just a little bit of bit about something that uh, I don't talk about too often, you see. I feel very comfortable with you beautiful people here tonight. And so I want to share a little bit of myself that, well, like I said, I don't usually get around to saying. And it goes a little something like this. He didn't think twice He said a thinking man He told you too much So know what you're doing Do as you must And learn to be It'll make you a 
My dad never realized, like, I, I don't think he realized how much of an inspiration he was to me, like, on all levels. Like, uh, we never agreed, we were always at odds with each other, and I think a lot of guys have this relationship with their dads, you know. Um, but I always tried to, to get it across, you know. Like, he was this fucking, like, you know, super ultra macho cop. Republican, like there was nothing that we saw eye to eye on. He thought I was like a drug addict, like possibly gay maniac, you know what I mean? But at the same time, our conversations and shit were the fruits, man, of all these fucking tunes, you know? He was the guy that put all the ideas into my head about don't just look at things for face value, you know, run away was a song that I wrote immediately based on a conversation that I had with him. Soldier was another one that I wrote right after talking to him about the cops and all the stuff. And it wasn't stuff that we were disagreeing on. There was definitely things we were disagreeing on, but they were things he was telling me about his impressions of things. You know, and then Rude and Reckless, obviously, you know. But I mean, these were the things. I, I always tried to tell him that, you know, I respected him, and I, I was inspired by him. And I gotta tell you, since he died, I had had a lot of trouble. I went through a time where I could not write a lot of stuff, you know, because I didn't have him to fucking bounce, to bounce things off, and to, to have these demented conversations with. Yeah. Arguments that would inspire you into, into creativity, you know? Because yeah. it, it all comes from this, this trauma. You know, if, if you're not being stirred up and confused and pissed off, a lot of things don't get knocked loose. You don't get the beauty. It doesn't come out, you know? There's just certain things you can't resolve. There's certain things people do in bands that you just can't. I mean, there's just so much shit that happens. Like, that if you, if you were to take it all personally, you would never get anything done. You know? Or you might, but you'd have the worst band you've ever heard. <laughs> like, it just wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. Wanting to get things done and getting things done efficiently are completely different things. You get eight guys in a room, all of them passionate about the same project, the odds of the project getting done become less and less because there will be so much fighting, squabbling, and stupidity as opposed to if one guy was really passionate, seven guys didn't care, they were just getting paid by the hour, you'd get it done much faster. It'd be like one guy going, okay, you do this, you do that, bum, 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 bum. Everybody would do their thing as opposed to eight guys going, no, no, I'm in charge. Listen to my brilliant idea. It's, it's you know, never-ending entertainment. If you get, you know, that, that many people together for that long an amount of time, in a van in particular, you're gonna, you're gonna build up resentments, like, however petty, you know, it's just gonna happen. And it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's really good, because it's not full of shit, you know, it's, everyone recognizes that that's just how it is. Yeah. And. You can fight about it and still wake up the next day and play a great show, you know. 
the joke that band guys always make is like being in a band is like having a girlfriend and that's not like some offhand remark that people say it is the same type of intimate relationship aside from the having sex part like you're doing everything else that you do in a normal relationship you know you're spending every minute together you're going on lots of trips together you're living together you're sleeping in the same beds a lot of time you get pissed off at the other people just because they do the same fucking things every day you know but you love them more than you love anyone else no you know it's like it really becomes that kind of like really deeply involved relationship between all the guys and they've been together like we keep saying like for what like what is it now 15 years Guess, it's a 15 or 16 years that, yeah. you know and like yeah i think it was 1990 they started right and like you're with guys for that long it's just you develop your own language you know you yeah. develop and you know you, you have you know you, and you make your jokes and you take fun you make fun of everybody but it's all in good fun it's all just what you do <laughs> so they, they went to go meet they went to go meet with james and the to club here in new york i gotta think about it and <laughs> they're like oh, we're gonna go hang out with james we're gonna hang out with james and just i don't know <laughs> Oh my God. No. I don't know. It's all true. It's like all true Vicky, stories. Victor, you're all wrong. You're all very, very wrong. It's not that coherent, though. It is. Well, well I'm, you know, like, give me the benefit of the doubt. You know what I mean? What do you? What do you There's a lot of a lot of hand motion. Like what do you think? A lot of this up here. Now, 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 do do me having a conversation with Dave. This, well, this is good. Let me. You do both, Dave and me. Having a conversation. Yeah. Come on, do it. Do it. You can do it. I was online. This is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. Okay. I really think. I really think the B flat. The B flat just brings a different kind of. You know, it lifts. Kind of lifts it. No. You have to teach me. I don't. I just don't understand. I just don't see the B flat really working. I just don't see the B flat. No, but the B flat. It's just got a certain. I don't know. Je ne sais quoi. I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. It's like you put in a soup. It's like a, a lime in a soup. I don't know. It's like. I don't know. I just don't like it. I just don't like the way. No, it's just. Where's my pen? I have a pen. Let's like, try and work this out on paper. Wait, these are the, I have the contracts what? here for the next three gigs. Um, wait, there's one in my sock over here. This is what I'm talking about. And then this guy yeah, behind yeah. us, he's like staring at yeah, me like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like watching his yeah, yeah. Wait, this is this shit? Whose jack is this? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Alright, I gotta play into a little bit of playing here. <laughs> oh no, is it? Uh, I got my two picks. <laughs> well, it's so funny, man, because it's like, you know, we've literally been sleeping in the same room and eating together and doing all this stuff together for years and years, you know. And even with. You know, that we recently we've had some lineup changes. It's still guys I've known for a long time, you know. And it's it's really it's just it's just a, it's it be, it's be sort of become its own alternative reality. And sometimes it's, it's the main reality in my life, you know. It's 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 um it's really really weird. I sort of have a compartmentalized life, you know. I have my home life, and then I have my slacker's life. And, uh, yeah, it's like people who know me really well. And it's just weird. I mean, they're, they're really good friends. But it, it's, just, it's just a weird way because there's so much emotional. There's always this emotional roller coaster going on. And that's just our position. We, I don't think we've ever been in a place where for like a year everything was just going really smooth and we just were making more and more money and more and more people, you know, and so it's... We we'll always have a crisis of some sort. There's always something on the horizon. We're always struggling to keep things afloat, one way or the other. You know, so it's 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 never. We're, we're just faded that it's never going to be easy. You just have to be out there hitting it all the time, playing this music. Again, it's difficult sometimes. It, it, there's a lot of wear and tear in your in your love life and everything else. If you're trying to hold down something, it it's difficult, and that's why a lot of times we write these songs. These you know, failed love such songs because, you know, 
because that's that's what happens you know you come up with the best intentions but you know it's difficult when you're on the road that much you know it's just it's brutal it, we, we realized 10 odd years ago that it would be really hard to make a living as a musician it's really hard to make a living any kind of living even a lousy one as a musician is tough and uh, nobody was going to hand it to us that if we wanted to do it it wasn't going to be a matter of like being the latest thing or looking in the latest style sounding like the latest sound it was going to be us doing what we wanted the way we wanted to do it because god forbid we get stuck doing it for 10 years and we don't like it so this is why we do what we do the way we like to do it because mm -hmm. we've been blessed amazingly blessed and we have been able to be musicians for 10 years it's incredible none of us ever dreamed it would be this good it is everything you can imagine except you think there's money there's no money there's poverty there's a lot of begging your girlfriend to pay your rent but there's joy in this. We get to go around and play the music we love. And occasionally you get somebody coming up to you giving you real validation for it, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that, that can make it all worthwhile. with music has always been to, to, to give back you know I've gotten so much from music you know I feel like everybody from like the Rolling Stones to fucking Muddy Waters Toots and the Maytals these guys fucking saved my goddamn life over and over again you know it made my life so much more beautiful and like the whole intention and the thing I always could get my dad with you know when he was like why do you do this shit you know it was always that. I have to try to give more, to give back what I've gotten from music. If I can somehow give it back, I'll be doing the right thing. Don't you know I wish I was
This girl's giving me a CD here. What am I going to do? I'll, I'll listen to it when I go home. Then I 